Dear Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for all that your throne stands for. Thank you for your amazing character of infinite mercy, amazing mercy, and wonderful justice. Thank you for Jesus today, through whom those traits were so beautifully manifest. Thank you that we can learn about him today. Father, I pray that you would help us today to see what we are. Help us to see an incredible need that we each have for you in our lives. Please help me to get out of the way. Please send the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be looking this morning at one of the times when Jesus wept. That's during the triumphal entry. Those two things seem to be antithesis to one another. On a triumphal entry, you would think that everything would be rejoicing and thrilling and just a wonderful experience. But on that day, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep as he looked at Jerusalem? Everybody else was rejoicing because Christ was going to become a king, they thought. We noticed last Sabbath in the feast at Simon's house. What day did the feast at Simon's house take place? What day was it? Charles, what day? It was on Sabbath. It was on the seventh day Sabbath or Saturday. We notice in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, that's where we're going to start this morning. John chapter 12, we know that Jesus was at Simon's house, the feast at Simon's house was on Sabbath, Desire of Ages, page 557 declares that. John chapter 12 tells us exactly what happened the next day after the feast on the Sabbath. John chapter 12, starting with verse 7, it's talking about the feast there, and Jesus declared, let her alone, talking about Mary, Magdalene, against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with me, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Now, verse 12 tells us, it says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So in John chapter 12 then, the feast at Simon's house, John chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, That was on Sabbath. Verse 12 tells us the next day was when the people took branches of palm trees and went forth and said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So on what day then did Jesus make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem? What day was it? It was Sunday. It was the first day of the week. Now you say, Bill... Why are you making such a big deal about what day these events took place on? Well, folk, there's a lot of people out there today that don't understand the day when Jesus died, 
the day when he rested in the tomb and the day that he rose again. A lot of people misunderstand those concepts. And folk, it's very, very important that we understand the chronological sequencing of the closing scenes of Jesus' life. Because that's just one other false teaching that's out there that we need to be aware of. So Jesus did, on Sunday, the first day of the week, make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I want you to notice in the book Desire of Ages, page 569, very, very clear here, it says it was on the first day of the week that Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So the Bible and the writings of Ellen White are very, very clear that this took place on the first day of the week. Now we noticed in verse 13 of John chapter 12, it says that many people took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now what did most people think was going to happen that day? Why were they so excited on that, on that Sunday? Why were they so excited about it? Okay, they were expecting a coup d'etat, all right? They were expecting Jesus to go into Jerusalem and to become king. They were hoping that Jesus would finally take the throne of David and become the king of the Jews. Now, what did the Jews expect once Jesus became king? What were they hoping and expecting would happen? Okay. Okay. The Jews were all expecting that when Jesus became king, that the Romans would be driven out and the Jews would then take over the whole world. And they were so excited because this was finally going to happen? Or was it? Somehow, in all the rejoicing, as the disciples were leading the way, Lazarus, of course, led the colt on which Jesus sat. Had not Jesus said that I'm going to my death? Had Jesus not said, when we go up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to be mocked, and I'm going to be crucified? Nevertheless, everybody was rejoicing that day. Now, why did Jesus allow that to happen? People were misunderstanding. Why did he allow that to happen? Why didn't he tell people, no, no, no? Why did he get on a colt and make a triumphant entry like a king? Okay, prophesied that that was what would happen. Zechariah chapter 9. Okay, Connie. Had Jesus allowed public display in his life before that event? He had never allowed that before. You remember in John chapter 6, after he had fed the multitudes? You remember Judas had urged the multitudes to make Christ king? What had Jesus done at that moment? What had he done? He told him to get out. He told him to disperse and leave. So why did Jesus do this? Connie, you said, it. well, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, there was a very distinct reason why Jesus did this. Desire of Ages, page 571 and 572, it says this. Never before in his earthly life had Jesus permitted such a demonstration. He clearly foresaw the result. It would bring him to the cross. But it was his purpose thus publicly to present himself as the Redeemer. He desired to call attention to the sacrifice that was to crown his mission to a fallen world. 
While the people were assembling at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, he, the anti-typical lamb, by a voluntary act, set himself apart as an oblation. It would be needful for his church in all succeeding ages to make his death for the sins of the world a subject of deep thought and study. Every fact connected with it should be verified beyond a doubt. It was necessary that the eyes of all people should now be directed to him. The events which preceded his great sacrifice must, must be such as to call attention to the sacrifice itself. After such a demonstration as that attending his entry into Jerusalem, all eyes would follow his rapid progress to the final scene. The events connected with this triumphal ride would be the talk of every tongue and would bring Jesus before every mind. After his crucifixion, many would recall these events and their connection with his trial and death. They would be led to search the prophecies and would be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah and in all lands, converts to the faith would be multiplied. So Jesus wanted every event of the closing scenes of his life laid out before the eyes of everyone so that then people would go back and study his life and they would study those closing scenes and they would realize that he was indeed the Messiah of Israel. That day, which seemed to the disciples the crowning day of their lives, would have been shadowed with gloomy clouds had they known that this scene of rejoicing was but a prelude to the suffering and death of their master. Although he had repeatedly told them of his certain sacrifice, yet in the glad triumph of the present they forgot his sorrowful words and looked forward to his prosperous reign on David's throne. misunderstood an event. I believe, folk, that sometime in the near future there's going to be another misunderstanding of an event. Right now we have people in our world that are getting so riled up and excited about a movie that's come out. And it seems to be uniting people from many, many crosses of life, many, many different denominations. And there seems to be a rejoicing. Sometime in the near future, there will be a rejoicing in our world over universal Sunday laws that will be passed. And yet those very laws will not be what they appear to be. They will actually be the forerunner to ruin in our world. But the world will rejoice just as they did at the triumphal entry. And God will allow those laws in the very, very near future. Why? Because He will then bring all the world to the attention of His Word and His law. We will see it again. What happened as they approached the crest of the hill? as the people were shouting and waving the branches. Go over in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 35, it says they brought him to Jesus, the colt. They cast their garments upon the colt. They set Jesus thereon. Verse 36, And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Prophecy had foretold this scene. Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem. And the Pharisees wanted to stop it. Master, they said, rebuke your disciples. Jesus said, if these people stop shouting and cheering, I'm not dependent on any human being or any group of people. The stones will start to scream. And when he was come near, verse 41, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Is that the same Jesus who preached glad tidings? Are those the words of Jesus who spoke about his Father's love and his Father's willingness to embrace humanity? Is that the same Christ? Those are hard words. If you'd known, at least now, what belongs to your peace, but now they're hid from your eyes. The days would come, your enemies would cast a trench around you, keep you in on every side, lay you even to the ground. When Jesus was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. What was it that brought Christ to tears as he saw Jerusalem? It was a gorgeous city. He knew they would reject him. Okay. Was Desire of Ages 576 and 577, it says the tears of Jesus were not in anticipation of his own suffering. Just before him was Gethsemane, where soon the horror of a great darkness would overshadow him. The sheep gate was in sight, through which for centuries the beasts for sacrificial offerings had been led. It was not because of these reminders of his cruel death that the Redeemer wept and groaned in anguish of spirit. The thought of his own agony did not intimidate that noble, self-sacrificing soul. It was the sight of Jerusalem that pierced the heart of Jesus. Jerusalem that had rejected the Son of God and scorned His love, that refused to be convinced by His mighty miracles and was about to take His life. He saw what was in her guilt of rejecting her Redeemer and what she might have been had she accepted Him who alone could heal her wound. He had come to save her, how could he give her up? Desire of Ages, page 577, it says, Christ came to save Jerusalem with her children. But Pharisaical pride, hypocrisy, jealousy, and malice had prevented him from accomplishing his purpose. 
Jesus knew the terrible retribution which would be visited upon the doomed city. Jerusalem. What's another word for Jerusalem? What is it? Jacob? Israel. Okay, and Jerusalem, of course, is the capital. What's another word for Jerusalem or Israel? For today, what is it? What's that, Dennis? Seventh-day Adventist? God's church? Paul? Okay, the word Jerusalem itself means peace. Also called Zion, all right? Also called Zion. Why couldn't Jesus save the church of the first century? And why is it, why is it that Christ cannot save the church at the end of earth's history? Same thing. Malice. What's malice? What's that? Dissimulation, okay? Extreme dislike, anger is malice, hatred, okay? What's pride? Selfishness. How do we manifest pride in a spiritual sense? Okay? How much need does pride have? How much need does pride think it has? None. Pride has no need. Pride is self-sufficient. Pride rests on its own laurels. Pride will do things its own way. Why did Jesus weep when he looked at Jerusalem? Because Jesus came to help Jerusalem. But Jerusalem didn't need him. Jerusalem had everything in order. Jerusalem Jerusalem was too religious. Jerusalem was too religious. And because it was too religious, when Jesus came to save Jerusalem, Jerusalem kept Christ at arm's length. And that's what broke his heart. That's what broke Christ's heart. Jesus came to save human beings who had a spiritual need. Jesus didn't come to save the spiritually proud, the spiritually confident. When's the last time somebody went to the doctor? The last time you went to the doctor is when you had a need. Because you were sick and you knew you were sick. That's when you went to the doctor. That's when you called Connie on the phone. When you realized you had a physical malady. I would have never found out about garlic and lemon juice if I hadn't have gotten a cold. Would have never found out about it. But I had a need. In the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, the very first thing that came out of Jesus' mouth. 
was, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty because it's to them that Christ came to save. Those who recognize their spiritual need, those who recognize they have a void, it is them to whom Christ can come and fill that void. But if I'm too full of what I'm doing and of my good deeds and my good works, what can Jesus do for me? Nothing. He'll weep over us, just as he wept over Jerusalem. And to those who recognize their spiritual need and those who recognize their decrepitness and their feebleness, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I've told this story several times, but I think it's worth repeating. I gave a sermon many, many years ago. It was called Jesus Loves Chubby Christians. And I made that comment, and there was an individual sitting in the church. And this individual, when I said that, she said, Amen! Now, she happened to be a little chubby. And uh, as I heard her yell out, Amen, I thought, I think she doesn't understand what I'm saying. If we're not hungry, we're not going to eat. And if we think that we can eat once a week, we're going to starve. And if we're going to come and get food on Sabbath morning that somebody else has eaten, and we're going to get it second hand and think that's going to give us strength, well, yes, it can bring us encouragement, but folk, that's not going to do. It's not going to do. We're going to be frail, skinny, emaciated Christians. We eat because we're hungry. We drink because we're thirsty. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst to fill that spiritual void in the life for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. But those who are rich and increased with goods, those who are self-sufficient in their spiritual deeds, will never find healing. Psalm chapter 51 Psalm chapter 51, the psalmist David, verses 16 and 17, the psalmist David, verses 16 and 17, he said, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. I thought God was the one who instituted the sacrificial system of offerings, didn't he? Yes, he did. But here the psalmist David says, 
You don't desire sacrifice, else would I give it. You delight not in burnt offering. Why did God institute the sacrificial service then? Verse 17. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. That's what Jesus wanted to see in Israel. That's what Jesus wants to see with us today. That's what he wants from us. He doesn't want our sacrifices, he doesn't want our religious services. He doesn't want that. He wants me. He wants you. He wants us to come to him with a broken heart and say, Lord, I need you. Help me. I'm a sinner. Clothe me. I'm blind. Give me sight. I'm destitute. I'm destitute, Lord. Give me your strength. That's what he wants. He wants us to come to Him as children who can't do it ourselves. When was the last time one of my children came to me and said, Dad, I need this. My son came to me this week. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. He said, Dad, can you pick me up? My car is going to be fixed. I said, Bud, tell me the time. When do you, when do you need me to get you? I said, if it works out, I'll be there. He said, such and such a time. Is that okay? I said, that's fine. I can fit it in. If my son expresses a need to me, am I going to shun him and say, forget it, sonny boy. Am I going to do that? No. Jesus longed when we express a need, when we express our poverty and our emptiness, because it's then that He can fill us and He can strengthen us. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, Thou wilt not despise. There isn't a human being in the world today, and there never has in the history of our planet, there's never been a human being that's gotten down on their knees and said, Lord, save me from me. Save me from my religiousness. That Jesus did not fill that Jesus did not come to that person and give them new life. There's never been a person who he turned away. The ones who never received were the ones who were too sufficient to ask. Jesus told a story about two people that went up to the temple to pray in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we will close on this short story this morning. Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. I find that so interesting that those two things go together. When somebody feels that they're righteous, they've always got something good to say about other people? No. It says they despise others. 
They want to shred others because the other people don't reach their standard. And so they feel righteous and they just shred everybody else. Those two things always go together. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Is that a prayer? It's what it says. Jesus is giving a story here, and he said that this man, but you know, notice who he's praying to. He's praying with himself. Verse 12 I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Did that man have a need? He was too religious. He was too good. He was too good. Could Jesus heal that man? Was that man interested in being healed? No. Because that man had it all together. He thought he had it all together. Verse 13. The publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified or forgiven rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The poor publican who prayed, God be merciful to me, a sinner, regarded himself as a very wicked man, and others looked upon him in the same light. But the publican felt his need, and with his burden of guilt and shame, he came before God asking for his forgiveness. In the book Steps to Christ, page 17 and 18, He who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his own shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ. But pride feels no need. And so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jesus wept for the Pharisee who had it all together, who despised others, who had no spiritual need. Christ wept for the hardened heart that felt no need for His grace. And it was to the publicans It was to the poor in spirit. It was to the broken and contrite heart that said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It was to that heart that Jesus could apply His healing balm. I pray this morning for each one of us That if we feel that our hearts are broken this morning, 
I know that as we go to Jesus, that we will experience healing. But if we're walking in the shoes of the Pharisee this morning and we think we've got it all together and we're righteous and we're despising other people and we're condemning other people for things they've done or are doing, I pray that God will allow things into our lives that will crush us so that we'll see our need for Christ so that we will all say as the publican did, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, Thank you that you help us to see what we are. Thank you that through life's experiences you help us to see what we're really made of. Thank you for the experiences when we so readily are unkind or look down at other people or are rude or impatient. Thank you that you give us those little experiences to help us realize that we have deep, desperate spiritual need. And thank you that when you show us that and you show us our deep need, you then lift up yourself upon a cross and say, there, there's healing there. There's mercy there. There's power there. Thank you so much that there's hope for the poor in spirit today. Thank you that there's hope for those who hunger and thirst to do your will, to follow your truth within and without. Thank you so much that those who come to you with need, you will in no wise cast out. In Jesus' precious name we pray and thank you. Amen.